Welcome to our Stearns Financial Future of Healthcare live chat, part one. <clears throat> this is our healthcare week. We have three sessions and today's session uh, involves not only the future of healthcare post C-19, but some folks who are working right in the middle of all of it right now. So uh, keep your questions handy. Uh, you'll have a lot of opportunities for those. So we are pleased to have with us today a whole host of guests on this particular call. Uh, we have uh, the two of the partners from Wavemaker and one of their key folks who are involved in the venture capital area of Wavemaker. <clears throat> Wavemaker, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a uh, venture capital firm that specializes in healthcare uh, based in California. And the, uh, the range of things that Wavemaker is involved with is pretty extensive. Um, John Knackle, who is with us, a uh, partner at Wavemaker, has had over 45 years in the healthcare area, originally ran that for Ernst and Ernst back in the day and actually ran one of their internal venture funds, uh, which I, I think, John, that was like $100 million plus back when that was actually a lot of money. <laughs> and, um, and so John has tremendous experience both in the healthcare area, serves on a number of major boards nationally, and again, very much involved in this whole healthcare innovation space. Uh, Jay Goss, he uh, is listed here as a startup guru. He is definitely in the middle of a lot of the startup work, and he's been doing that for a number of years. And so it's not surprising that uh, he's in the middle of some of the most interesting things going on right now in healthcare. And then we have Eric Martin, uh, our health system guru. So he grew up inside health systems, kind of knows inside baseball when it comes to how health systems work. And so uh, th those three will talk about a, a lot of things, healthcare. And then we have, if that's not enough, two special guests, both of them CEOs of companies that are making amazing things happen. And uh, we'll let them get introduced by our Wavemaker folks. So John, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Dennis. And what we're gonna do is walk you through some major trends that are going through healthcare right now. They're, these aren't trendy things. There's plenty of those out there. We're gonna go through the things that we think will influence healthcare over the next 10 to 20 years. So we're not looking at this week or this, the uh, flavor of the week. We're looking at things that are gonna have a major transformative influence on the industry. The, the things that we've identified are volume to value-based care, consumerism, which Jay will cover, precision health, which Eric will cover. And if you want to see the fourth trend, you're going to have to come back Friday. So we have a Friday session dedicated to COVID. And so we, th we thought it was important enough to not just do this as a, a quick and dirty topic today. So come back Friday and you'll hear all about COVID. So I'll start with uh, the, the trend of value-based care. So what's happening in healthcare is for 40 years, we were under a fee-for-service basis for payment for healthcare. A physician got paid for what's called the CPT code. A hospital got paid for a day of care an admission, a DRG, different types of means, but everybody got paid based on delivering a service. In other words, volume. The incentives were for volume. The incentives were to get patients into healthcare. So you were paid for medical need rather than trying to keep patients out of the hospital. What the value-based payment method is, is to pay for a population of people. You, so under Medicare Advantage in, the, in particular, you got paid for a population. You get paid for taking care of a group of people for a year, two years, five years. So now the incentive is to keep the patient out of the hospital, to keep the patient free of healthcare needs, not using 
emergency rooms, not using ambulance services, but rather preventing those things. So that's the basic premise that we're at right now. We're still in the fee-for-service world in some part of the country. We're way down the slope and up the slope on value-based care in other parts of the country. The West Coast, where I live in Southern California, where most hospitals have large numbers of at-risk contracts. In the Midwest, there's hardly any. It's just a few percentage of their total revenue. And on the East Coast, it's somewhere between those two. So what the impact of this is, lots of entrepreneurs are coming out of the woodwork, trying to find those services and products that will help corporate healthcare achieve the goals for value-based care. So just to give you a contrast of where we're coming from, and this was not by accident that I put this slide in here. This is our healthcare system as depicted with all the government agencies that oversee healthcare. And to give you some sense of how bad it is, uh, a hospital in Southern California that was trying to build a new facility had 287 agencies that they had to get approval from to build their facility. It's just unbelievable the complexity and the, the uh, complexity is probably the, the right word, but also the confusion. So com complexity and confusion. The other comment I wanted to make on this slide is the lower left-hand corner. There's lots of opportunity for innovation as a result of this. Every one of those circles has problems. Every one of those agencies in government has issues that they're dealing with that can be solved by entrepreneurs. We think this is a great opportunity for change in the healthcare system. And then you overlay that with COVID and we really have some change going on in this industry. So John? Yes. John, we have a question already. And that question is, <clears throat> is the future of our healthcare system in the next 10 years more gonna be driven by entrepreneurs or by the government? Well, the answer is both. So entrepreneurs are going to change how we address things, but the government's gonna change how we get paid for those things. And so the payment system makes a big difference. And Malia will give you an example a little bit later uh, of uh, how a change in the uh, Medicare payment rules allows for better payment for Alzheimer's. So I'll, we'll, I'll leave it at that and let her jump on that one later. But payment does drive the system. And I'm gonna show you in a second here, Jay, if you'd go on to the next slide, we have a real misaligned incentive. So Dave, uh, Dennis, that question is perfect timing. Uh, the problem right now is the incentives are for patients to go into a hospital. They're acute care episodes. And where the real value is, is keeping that patient out of the hospital by providing wellness care, by providing preventive services. And I'll give us a very simple example of smoking cessation. So everybody knows that if you stop smoking, you, you will do better from a health perspective. And yet there is no incentives in the healthcare system to prevent smoking. The payers, that patient will probably not be around in a few years when that uh, savings from smoking cessation happens. So therefore, it, there, the incentives are really misaligned here. And Jay, the last slide that I'm gonna do on value-based care. So what is value? It's, it's quality over cost, which in, if you look at the numerator here, it's outcomes plus the patient experience. I like to think of it as uh, the outcomes is the important component. And, and yet we don't really have good definition of what outcomes are in healthcare. So a lot of work in the last few years have gone into how do you define a good outcome from a bad outcome? And then 
you look at that compared to costs. So that's what value-based healthcare is all about. It's This is a long-term transition. It's driven by the question that you asked of uh, payer payment. So the government's going to drive it, the payers are going to drive it, but ultimately the way it's responded to is by innovators. Eric? I mean, Jay, I guess, is next. Thanks, John. So I'm here and I get to talk to you all about healthcare consumerism. I'll let you let you absorb the, the comic at the bottom because that, that maybe more or less sums the whole thing up. But this is a trend, meaning healthcare consumerism, that probably all of us on this video conference call have already been directly a part of. Um, this, this concept or paradigm of healthcare consumerism, it, it comes out of a world that we're all very familiar with, meaning the retail world. And it's gotten a lot of attention since the Affordable Care Act, but it started to come together before the Affordable Care Act. Um, I think of it as, I think of healthcare consumerism, if I was to try to put a singular definition around it, as something that you could describe as a movement. Um, it calls for patients' involvement in their own healthcare decisions. Certainly, Anil and his company, Citizen, are going to talk a lot about this. Um, where we've mostly been, uh, for probably most people on this phone, um, certainly anybody on the phone over 25 or 30 years old is, has lived in a world where the doctor says to do something and the patient does it. This, this model of healthcare consumerism transitions away from that to more of a working partnership between the doctor and the patient. Um, what's enabling this and, and why this is happening now faster and, and arguably better is because we have the internet. Um, it's because we've transitioned away from all of those medical records being in paper in file cabinets behind the doctor's receptionist to electronic medical record systems and the rise of high deductible health plans, which makes, which gives us all incentives to focus more on this. There's 70 million plus Americans, don't know where that number will be at the end of this year, but as of last year, there were about 70 million Americans that were on these high deductible health plans. And that gives us all an incentive to be a much bigger and better and smarter consumer when it comes to healthcare than it did a generation ago. And I think one of the places that this is going and that we're keeping our eye on is, is around brands. You know, we have the Marriott and Ritz Carlton and we have Nordstrom and versus Macy's and we have Chrysler versus BMW. Well, you're going to start to see brands pop up and become more important in your decision-making process in healthcare too. We're not there yet, but it's definitely on the way. The, the biggest place that we think these, this branding and consumerism of healthcare is going to really play out is around three elements that successful healthcare companies will do well in order to establish their brand. They'll deliver and compete on value, a lot of what John just described. They'll deliver more convenient healthcare. And they'll do both of those things consistently. It won't be that one hospital location does it one way and another hospital does it another way. It's got to all be the same regardless of what their formula is. And lastly, I think one interesting way to look at this uh, that, that I appreciate is that the retail world is really learning healthcare faster right now than the healthcare world is learning retail. I'll let that sink in, but, that, but that's another big trend that we see and another reason we think innovators and entrepreneurs are gonna take advantage of this. And then lastly, and not leastly, is the role of she in all of this. The, the woman's role in healthcare is going to be all important, more important as we move towards this consumerism. About 40% of women are medical caregivers for another person in their life, typically a family member. Um, they're the chief decision makers. And you can bet that healthcare companies and healthcare brands are positively paying attention to this phenomenon. Um, and that the, the future of where healthcare goes vis-a-vis -vis healthcare consumerism is largely gonna be driven by their directing those campaigns, directing those products, directing the services, even directing the technology 
towards the the female as the chief mark as a chief decision maker for the family or, or for a group of people and with that i'm gonna hand it off to eric all right hi everyone all right so we've heard about value-based care the rise of value-based care we've heard about consumerism and at the end of the day, it's really about how those two things come together so that we can truly drive the outcomes we're looking for, right? Longer life, better quality of life, um, and really wellness at the end of the day. So, you know, those of you that read the healthcare news, whether it be, you know, in scientific journals or just in, in the lay press, there's a lot out there right now about precision medicine, transformative science that we are all going to have a chance to benefit from in our lifetimes, whether it's us personally or through our family members, and truly incredible. That said, what we're reading about is primarily still about treating illness. Critical, wonderful, but not the whole picture. But I quickly walk you through what's happening in precision medicine, because I think it's worth just thinking about really the power of, uh, of what's being presented to us all. So currently, if you think about how a drug comes to market, that drug gets tested on thousands of patients before it's approved for use on a particular condition. That drug is then prescribed to patients based on the fact that on average, across those thousands of patients, that drug worked better than other drugs. That does not mean that for the individual patient, that's the best therapy. So the power of what we're all reading about now, our DNA analysis, genomics, and the other tests that go with it, allow us to come up with a profile on an individual that says, okay, of all the therapies that are available, all the medications that are out there, for you specifically, because of your background, your race, your gender, your environmental factors, your metabolism, the drug that worked kind of on average best for everybody, it's not going to work well for you at all. And there's this other therapy that's available based on your personal profile that's going to give you the greatest outcome. So you can see under current medicine, given to a large population, sometimes there's an effect Sometimes there's no effect. Sometimes there's a, a bad effect to a particular therapy. When we really focus on the individual, we can hone in on the therapies we know are going to have an effect on that individual. So a wonderful thing. But again, only one piece of the puzzle because this all matters most when we're ill. So what are we really focusing on now? We're talking about adding this to all of the other information that we can now gather and more that will be gathered on each of us as individuals and in our families, our communities, and the population at large to drive what John, Jay, and I like to refer to as precision health. This is beyond the omics, the, you know, what's in my DNA. Um, not that that's not critical, and we're hearing a little bit of conversation now about the genetic counseling that's happening based on someone's DNA analysis, what might someone be worried about in the future, but how to manage that data, how to parse through it, how to think about how to connect that information with all of the other things you see around this circle, whether it's information coming from your, your Fitbit or it's you know, tracking you know, nutrition by person or patient or, or otherwise. Um, medications that you've been on, medical history, um, the environment that you happen to uh, live in, your level of fitness, all of those things can be brought together really throughout someone's lifetime. And that will allow us by bringing all the technologies together to preserve wellness, keep people well, to John's earlier point, nobody wants to go to a hospital and it's remarkably expensive. So if we can keep people healthy and at home living their lives, we're going to be best off if we can help them optimize their performance along the way because we've brought all this information together even better and if we do this right we can all enjoy kind of a lifetime of personalized of course private monitoring and navigation as we move through so 
you know, when we think about what is it going to take to make this happen, and it is, in fact, the bringing together of all this information, you're going to hear specifically from uh, Anil Sethi and his colleague Martin and then Mylea about how they are really contributing to what you're seeing in this circle. And among the list of kind of the disruptive technologies that support this effort, on the next slide, um, this is, I will say, this is a short list, but these are the things that John, Jay, and our other partners and I spend a lot of time thinking about is how to, again, bring together all of this information. We talked about the genomics and DNA factor, artificial intelligence. Again, you're going to hear Anil Sethi talk about what it means to, the, to leverage machine learning, to let computers bring together information on a patient from every imaginable source and put that information into the hands of the patient so that they are empowered to make decisions, to do planning, and to work with their care team better than ever before. Sensor technology, what we call the quantified self, the fact that there are some incredible technologies emerging now that can track various aspects of our our well-being as we move through life in ways that we never thought imagined or never imagined before. Yes, we can track heart rate with an Apple Watch, but there's a lot more coming. Virtual reality and AR, I won't spend a lot of time on that. Telehealth, of course, with COVID-19. People are finally, I think, paying telehealth the respect that it deserves. And of course, new technologies are letting us deliver remote healthcare, uh, again, in ways never seen. Uh, neuroscience 2.0, we've got Mylea, who's going to really share you know, what life without dementia might look like. Um, what does it take to bring all this information together to get ahead of these debilitating illnesses and, uh, and uh, you know, change the quality of life for folks? CRISPR, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on gene editing, but suffice it to say, uh, enormously powerful. And then back to what we originally talked about, bringing precision medicine, the idea that we're not just doing what's standard of care because it worked well for the masses. We're focusing on what we call the N of one. Uh, rather than thousands of subjects on a trial, the one, the one person that needs treatment, care, support now, and leveraging information for that purpose. So with that, um, I will introduce Anil Sethi, who uh, is the CEO of Citizen, uh, one of our portfolio companies. I consider a dear friend and one of the true thought leaders in uh, healthcare IT and artificial intelligence. Um, this is not Anil's first rodeo. He is a very successful serial entrepreneur, sold his last company to Apple, and much of what you now see from Apple Health Records and their other applications are based on Anil's good work. Um, but with that, Anil Sethi. Neil, you're on mute. You're on mute. Yes, I am. I was saying thanks to Dennis, uh, John Jay, and Eric. And unfortunately, I was saying it on mute. So let me just pop up a screen. Host disabled. I'd like uh, control of the screen, if possible. Uh, yeah, it's not. Um, where's Bill? Maybe we can get screen control freed up. I think we have liftoff. Yes, we do, sir. Can you guys see that screen? We do. Very good. I will. Um, we have 15 minutes. I'll try to move as fast as I can. I'm generally a fast talker anyway. Um, uh, but I'll save at least five minutes for a short, real demo. Uh, it may or may not work. Demos tend to blow up just when you don't wish for them to, but we'll see what happens. Um, they make me put up this, um, this screen. Um, there's a lot of people at the company. Um, 
Anil Sethi, I'm the founder and CEO. I, uh, in Silicon Valley, at least, I tend to be the older guy in any room. Uh, I've been doing this about 31 years across a, a number of startups, and uh, they, they've done modestly well. Uh, in the past uh, five startups, I've got two currently. Citizen is the one that I'm operational in. And um, the previous five, one failed. Uh, one we took public on the NASDAQ. Three had successful exits. Um, and most recently, Apple acquired Glimpse, a personal health records company for that technology. And then two years later, released um, uh, Apple health records based um, somewhat on that technology. And all my original team is in there. Um, but I had to leave. And um, we'll talk about why. When I was running health engineering and consumer health strategy in Cupertino, I got the dreaded call that my little sister, who had been earlier very sick with late stage metastatic breast cancer, I got the call to come home to Maryland because Hopkins said she has two weeks to live. And I got to tell you, folks, that is the strangest string of words ever to produce a sentence. Your little sister has two weeks to live. Um, I went to the powers to be and um, both Jeff uh, and Tim, they released me, took very good care of me. We bought Tanya five more months of life, but she finally died on, of all days, 9-11 of 2017. That's a photo of my little sister. She is our muse. This is another image of my little sister. And although I live in the tech industry and I love the work that I do, we can't forget it's not zeros and ones. This is a horrible picture of a human being. I took this when she was uh, very young. It's a square, so it's got to be a Polaroid. I, yeah, and uh, unfortunately, when I took this when she was uh, beginning of life, I didn't know I would be taking this at the end of life. And I do these on purpose just so we know why we do this work. It's not rah-rah machine learning. Yes, that's all intellectually interesting, which makes the pull towards this industry that much stronger. The cheapers creepers. Um, so what do we do? Uh, Citizen is a platform. You hear this all the time. I know how to define it. Look at the gray hair. I've been around platforms for a long time. AWS is a platform. Google is a platform for search. Facebook is a platform for social. Citizen is attempting to be uh, the platform for health. So when you think about health, you will think about Citizen and vice versa. The important thing to remember is that in the analog world, where all of this information is generated, the operative word is analog. And in computational biology or precision medicine, it's the computational part that we are venturing into. It's not the biology part, which we've really got a good handle on, atoms and molecules and chemistry. So what Citizen does is we use the patient's HIPAA right of access which nobody can de deny the patient, to go fetch all of their records. When I went through Tanya's patient portal at Hopkins, we had a smattering of good, useful information. When I used her HIPAA right of access, I got a dump of 2,300 pages, uh, print to PDF, plus I got all her genomic, plus I got all her um, imaging, none of which is coming through a portal. So let's be clear that we need to help patients release their analog paper records or PDF, whatever have you, and then transform it, much like if data was oil, we would be, a, we would be Exxon Mobil. We would transform the crude oil that comes into the back of the refinery and put out 93 octane because that is computable. So it's patient mediated, it is a platform, and it turns uh, documents into computable data. And then the data can be used for real world evidence and trials, second opinions, virtual tumor boards. We could go on and on. This is purposely um, uh, blurred out because it's a live clinical note. Our machine reads this. And it's important because this is where all the juicy information is. I'll pause here just for a moment. When um, when Tanya was in her last year of life, we crisscrossed the country. She saw 17 different facilities and 
um, across the US, um, all the oncologists went into the clinical notes. They went into the pathology report. That's a narrative and word or whatever. They went into the imaging report and they go to a section called findings. And there's a couple of paragraphs right there. And it says, six metastases were found in the right lobe of the liver at this size and location. None of that comes off the patient portal. You gotta get the PDF documents. You gotta get the pathology reports, the clinical notes. This is where all, this, all the, the juicy information is. Um, and so this is what we've decided to do. We've built an engine that knows how to read clinical narrative and produce extracted information. This is a caricature, but this is the kind of thing that we can generate from that previous thing. In order to do that, we have to solve two hurdles. Um, well, two, two class of hurdles. Tech on this slide and regulatory on the next slide. Um, you will be hearing, you the audience, we all are hearing, there are a certain number of APIs, uh, programming interfaces, portals, you might hear the term FHIR, F-H-I-R. Um, those are all um, names of technologies that allow patients to take their Apple health records, which I helped build, and then connect to a portal, which is in front of a medical record system at Stanford or UCLA or what have you. The problem is that off of those portals, only about seven to 10%, maybe less, of the information they hold on you, Dennis, is on that portal. The rest of the 90% is behind the firewall in those clinical notes and narrative. That's the good stuff. So whenever you see someone say, look, I've got a personal health record, the first question to ask them is, do you connect to the portal? And if the answer is yes, run the other way. That's not good enough. That's what Apple does. God bless the company, but I disagree with their approach. But what you really want to do is get all the clinical notes, all the imaging, all the genomics. Now we're cooking with curry. And not only that, but sometimes uh, different facilities will call something heart attack. Another place will call it myocardial infarction. And the third one, we'll call it MI. And there's 40 more terms for generally what we call heart attack. So these portals and APIs don't confer any semantic interoperability. We do that, citizen. We know that this thing really means that thing because people speak different vocabularies uh, in the clinical setting, in the research setting, or the billing setting. And we have a semantic thesaurus that matches that. So those are the kinds of things that we solve from a technology hurdle. Here's the regulatory hurdle. We do know that folks, um, that companies will take uh, cohorts of clinical information. They'll strip out the what's called the PHI, personal health uh, identifier. And that information is now stripped of that PHI it's no longer under the re regulatory umbrella of HIPAA, which governs our uses of data, but they will walk that data out the door, out the back door, they'll monetize it, they'll put it into analytics. We don't believe that's scalable. We think the right way to do this is to go in straight through the front door, which is have the patient ask for all their records, and we have TurboTax, that very typically onerous request and response activity. So that was the first thing. We go through the patient. Um, we've never had any blowback from 1,100 or so facilities that we're connected with. No long contracting periods, not with the patient. No integration adapters, no technology, no data governance and regulatory issues. The patient has the right. They, they get all their records put in the the um, crude oil, and we get out the front end um, very useful information. A couple more slides, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague. Here is a very noisy and messy slide, but it's really broken up into three areas. Uh, obviously, there's a bunch of logos on here. All the way to the left in the middle is my former uh, company, um, Apple. There are a lot of people in the personal health record space. 
and sometimes citizen gets compared to them and we have to remind the person comparing, you know, we don't connect up to that portal that you and Health Gorilla and Validic and everyone else connects up to. So we don't compete with those people. Those people compete with Apple and we know how that's going to end up. We go behind the firewall where there is dark data in those thousands of PDF pages and we put them up through our chipper shredder to get all kinds of information that doesn't come off of the portals um, that feed information to these personal health records. In the center column, B2B is the way that it's currently done. I have a cohort of infra information. You would like to uh, help me monetize it. I strip off the headers and now a business to business transaction can happen. Um, we don't think that scales for many reasons. Certainly it doesn't scale globally. In any country that you think of, um, there is a patient's right to get their information. Um, so we are patient-centric. Um, patient the final thing is we've automated what a colleague of ours had said that Flatiron did with, did with people. They took it all, all its core information and documents and things like that, unstructured, and they hired plus or minus a thousand people to sit there and key it in uh, analog to digital. So what they did was they used humans that were augmented by tech. We have tech that's augmented by humans. The results are very different. We can scale um, uh, both in speed and time and internationally because just remember, if you hook up to an API or a portal that is front-ending medical record systems at Stanford, those medical record systems don't, they don't exist in China or India or Sub-Saharan Africa or large parts of Western Europe. They just don't. So where you have a computer, you can pretty much do a print to PDF and that's our go-to. Um, this is what we get data from. This is kind of where we're going. You should be able to ask a question of your profile that characterizes your clinical um, um, nature. But remember, this is all the tech. It's very exciting. I'm excited to be in there, but this is what we're working on. I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Martin, who I'm afraid I've given very little time to, but I've, I've watched his demo. It's pretty magical. Martin, I'm going to give up the screen and see if you can jump on. Sure. Um, so thanks, Anil. Thanks for having me on the webinar today. Uh, my background, I've been working on helping cancer patients uh, access new medicines for over a decade. And um, a big part of that was starting a company a few years ago uh, called Cure Forward, uh, where we, we uh, tried to operate at the level of detail that Anil just described using medical record information to find uh, trial options for patients. And it took too long. In fact, that company was unsuccessful because of the amount of human work that it required. Um, and, uh, and so I'm very excited to be working with Anil. I wanna show you what the input looks like to a process that gets patients to the specific clinical trials that could be suitable from that for them in a precision medicine and immuno-oncology treatment world. Um, so, just a little bit of background. Um, clinical trials, there are about 1.7 million new cancer cases per year in the US. 25% of those people could qualify for trials, but only 5% actually enroll. So there's room to improve participation by 5X. Now, two thirds of clinical trial sites fail to meet enrollment requirements and 20% of trials fail because of inadequate enrollment. So, um, the, de the trials desperately need the patients, and these are, these are sick cancer patients who are really you know, searching for uh, uh, in urgent moments in their care for treatment options, and they need answers fast. Um, so I want to go ahead and, uh, and start a screen share to show you how we can do what used to take me three to four days manually. Now we can do it in less than two minutes per patient uh, with a series of uh, scripts and software. And that is being compressed right now to a matter of seconds. Um, so, so first thing to show you, and this is 
our, our software that we're working with for prototyping is, uh, is Google Suite, so it looks a little bit like a spreadsheet, but uh, it's actually software. Um, and this is the output of the citizen refinery process that Anil just described, the ExxonMobil 93 octane uh, coming off the, the citizen platform. This is what you can see about a patient. This is a woman uh, who has uh, bile duct cancer. It's called cholangiocarcinoma. Um, and she had ovarian cancer about a decade ago. So this is a particularly complex patient because you could accidentally um, blend together different cancer treatments over two different you know, cancer histories. Well, the system actually splits those out by which diagnosis is related to every treatment and every observation. And you can see, for instance, moment by moment, how this patient has been progressing or stable or responding to treatments. Uh, you can also see her uh, performance status, which is very important for identifying trial options. Um, and then at the molecular level, this is what Eric was talking about with precision medicine, uh, you can see the specific mutations and amplifications. You can see the patient's overall tumor mutation burden, um, as well as their, their lines of treatment. So uh, a chemotherapy regimen, uh, there was some toxicity to the first ingredient, so it continued with just one ingredient. Uh, and, then, uh, and, and then a targeted treatment that didn't work. Um, and so this patient is looking for treatments. And, uh, and so what we're able to do, um, the, the very first problem that we have to solve is that trials and medical records are in different languages. So the first thing we do is translate the patient into clinical trial speak, which means selection concepts. So rather than saying that the patient has, has uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, which most trials don't specify, uh, we translate that to bile duct cancer. We translate that elaborate treatment that she had to be a PARP inhibitor and, and a number of other things too. And so the, those are the, uh, the light blue uh, items on the right-hand side of the screen, but then those just get turned into a patient eligibility card with one click. Now that patient is ready for matching. And I'm gonna take you into an options report that was generated by a matching algorithm that sorts that patient into four different match types. So A is that the patient matches every selection criteria we know of for a particular trial, inclusion and exclusion. B is that the patient is adjacent for something. Uh, meaning that there's something in their record that could change that would make them eligible for the trial. So it's too early to exclude them and too early to include them, but we, we call that adjacency. Then there's near mat, a, a near match with missing information, meaning that the patient um, could qualify for a trial, but we need to know something about a biomarker that wasn't tested or their, um, we need to know their blood pressure or something about their, um, their health record that didn't come through to us yet. Um, and, and then the, the fourth kind is, that there's an adjacent match with missing information. Uh, and, and so we'd have to sort out both of those things. So um, in this particular case, this, this patient who has uh, you know, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, uh, who has progressing disease, who's been through two prior lines of treatment and is currently metastatic, um, has a very specific trial options list. Now, she has specified in our platform that she's, she lives in Columbus, Ohio, and she can travel within 100 miles of her home. She can also travel to her relatives' homes in New Haven or New Orleans. And, uh, and because of those uh, preferences, we can tell her that there are two actively recruiting trials within her location preferences. Um, and one of them is a targeted treatment trial, and the other is an immunotherapy trial, which activates the patient's immune system to fight her cancer. That's really exciting. Now, this is a patient who's been through all the lines of standard care available through modern medicine. She's, she's at the end of the line, but she has two great options that are both A grade matches. Now, if, you, if, if she wanted to continue outside her location preferences, she can see other trials from other drug sponsors um, who are operating trials across the country. And then she can also see one example here of a trial where she has missing information. If she was tested for this particular biomarker, she could be included in, uh, in this trial. So, uh, Mark, that's, that's the end of the demo, and I uh, just want to tell you how this ends for, a, you know, for, for, for trial matching for a patient. That was really um, um, a lot of science, a lot of software, very complicated. If you remember nothing from this, remember that 
someone is going to build a platform that characterizes a patient in digital zeros and ones at the level that precision medicine can really target them. So we will have a, a uh, digital characterization of the patient and a digital characterization of the physician. Um, the physician will be queries, machine learning, AI, all of those will be queries and activities that will run against the digital version of the patient and they'll all happen on Citizen. I appreciate the opportunity. I know we're over time. Super exciting stuff. You're on mute, Dennis. Sorry, I did it too. We, uh, we had a couple of questions, but we only really have time for one. Um, and, and I guess synthesizing together some of the questions, it relates to, do, do you believe, we heard earlier in the presentation about um, women being at the center of healthcare decisions. We heard you say that, you know, Apple and some of your work post Apple, you're developing information. Is it for the consumer? Is it for other physicians or technicians? Or how does that all connect together? Yeah, um, I'll take it for 30 seconds and we can close up. Um, it turns out that the patient is the least utilized asset in all of healthcare delivery. That's a cliche, but it's a cliche because it's true. So there will be marketplaces with buyers and sellers. And depending on who's on which side, that will include the patient on one side. We will have market economics as we put, push risk down to employers and patients. And so in this marketplace, you will need a, a offering, a virtual tumor board or second opinion, that finds patients that can use that information because they're on the platform. The patient doesn't have to go look for services, either hardware or software, but those services, once running on the marketplace, they will find the patient and sort of install themselves into the inbox, much like I don't buy anything on Amazon anymore. It just suggests stuff to me that I really don't need, but I click order anyway. <laughs> okay, well, <clears throat> it sounds like we could do a whole nother session just on that topic. But uh, I think we need to move on. So <laughs> thank you. And um, uh, Eric, did you want to, did you want to introduce our next guest? Oh, I, I have a feeling Jay was planning to do this introduction, but I'm always happy to, uh, to introduce Malaya. Jay, did you want to take it? I'll just introduce Malaya founder and CEO of an incredible company called Savonix. I'll leave it at that and Malaya, it's all yours. I was, I had the advantage. I, I went later, so I had pra you know, practice reminding myself to hit the unmute button. Thanks for being with us today, everybody. I'm gonna hope that the share screen works here. Can you guys see my screen? Awesome. Um, so, you know, earlier when John w was talking about the companies in the portfolio and, and Jay was talking about it, they talked about my vision for a world without dementia. And this really started for me a long time ago. Uh, Savonix was incorporated in 2015, but I say that it started in Kansas in 1985 in my mother's kitchen. And that's because that's the year that this woman here, my, my paternal grandmother, Edna, seen holding me when I'm about a month old, um, developed what was undeniably Alzheimer's disease. I actually went on to lose both of my grandmothers, both paternal and maternal, to this disease. And this impacted me all uh, greatly. I was actually studying music. I was on my way to a career as a concert pianist. And that got derailed because I all of a sudden decided that I was going to solve this problem. That this was going to be, this was going to be my life's work. Um, I was going to grow up and become a, a brain doctor, which I didn't know what that meant at age 13. Um, I did become a neuropsychologist, um, and that was what I was doing. I was director of clinical training at Stanford and seeing patients and, and running a very large uh, pharmaceutical and psychotherapy trials and traumatic brain injury, dementia, decision-making. 
um, when it hit me, um, if she was alive today, either of my grandmothers would have taken them 18 months to get an appointment to see me, eight years to get an accurate diagnosis, and neither one of them could have afforded me. And that's not a scalable, effective solution. And I wasn't doing the work that my 13-year-old self had dedicated herself to. And so my 39-year-old uh, self <laughs> decided to do something different. And I turned down a tenure track offer at UCSF uh, to head their traumatic brain injury unit and started Savonics. So in other words, um, my family all pretty much think I'm nuts um, at this point. Why are we doing this? Um, there's a people problem, which I just talked about, and that's what we felt in my family. There are um, right now more, more people over the age of 65 than under the age of five globally, and, and this is a trend that is going to continue as, as birth rates decline. Um, the cost of dementia is accelerating rapidly, and when we look at the global cost of dementia, um, it surpassed one trillion in 2018. Uh, the WHO had estimated that it was going to be 800 billion, and, and obviously they, they were wrong. This is uh, becoming uh, the expense on this in terms of cost is accelerating rapidly. And people like me, neuropsychologists, well, there's about 1,061 of us board certified in the US and Canada, 4,200 globally. Go back over and you think right now that there are more than 50 million people living with dementia. Do the math, there's no way that we can see these patients. There's no way that we can assess them, diagnose them, create treatment plans for them one-on-one um, -on -one in, in a treatment room. It's, it's, not, it's not going to happen. And so we need scalable solutions. What's happening right now is actually making things worse. So when we look at the lifestyle risk factors for the development and progression of dementias, including Alzheimer's disease, um, loneliness and social isolation is associated with a 40% increased risk for the development and progression of dementia in those over the age of 60. This is really important because we have a lot of elderly people right now with the COVID stay at home orders that are becoming more isolated than they've ever been before. And so what we're seeing um, among our partners in the healthcare system is, an, is a concern that this disease, which was already uh, slated to be what, what many are calling a dementia tsunami, we're actually expecting the problem to get much worse due to the social isolation and social distancing that's being enforced because of the coronavirus. We think about this problem as really being the intersection of two problems that create right now what is a very vicious cycle. So earlier Martin mentioned it when he spoke um, about the fact that 28%, I'm sorry, 25% of, of clinical trials in oncology fail due to lack of enrollment. In Alzheimer's disease, that number is 48%. 48% of clinical trials fail due to lack of enrollment in Alzheimer's disease. And a lot of this is because we don't identify patients early enough. Um, we're in some partnerships now with some major pharmaceutical companies, including Bayer, who tell us that by the time healthcare providers diagnose a patient with dementia and refer them to the study, they're too advanced to qualify for the study because most of the drugs are targeting early to moderate stage Alzheimer's. Let me tell you how Alzheimer's is diagnosed in primary care today. It's gonna to scare all of you. It's really gonna scare Neil because I'm gonna use a breast cancer analogy. So imagine that I, as a woman today, walk into my doctor's office and say, hey doc, I found a lump. And his answer is, oh well, a lot of women develop lumps. That can happen as you get older. You go home and you come back in a year and if that lump is bigger, we might take a look at it then. That's what we do to patients when they say, hey, I'm having problems with thinking or memory or concentration or I don't feel like myself. Women get told usually that it's because it happens to coincide with menopause. My grandmother was told that it was menopause many times. It wasn't, it was Alzheimer's disease. And so we have you know, a lot of mischaracterization of this disease in its early stages because the kind of testing, sensitive, neuropsychological assessment that gets at domains like executive function and different types of memory, delayed memory, immediate memory, procedural memory, working memory. That kind of testing requires somebody like me right now. And that's what Savonix was built to change. And I'll talk to you a little bit about our product suite. But what we have is we're not finding people early enough in the care environment to intervene in ways that we can intervene now, lifestyle risk factors, early intervention drugs, and there are a few. 
we're not finding them early enough to get them into clinical trials, so trials are failing, which means we don't get answers about promising therapeutics because the trials fail, which means those therapeutics don't get sent back into the care system. We change that. We take a vicious cycle and we turn it into a virtuous cycle. And we do it simply by democratizing access to neuropsychology, by productizing huge pieces of what I used to do as a specialist. If I do this right, and so far it looks like we are based on our commercial traction, I'm gonna have to find something else to do um, after this. Because neuropsychology will forever be changed. Um, we won't be doing testing anymore. We'll be doing therapy. I don't believe in replacing uh, doctors with technology. I don't want to live in a world where humans don't care for one another anymore. But I do believe that technology can take over huge segments, like reading an MRI or, ta or <clears throat> telling me how many times you tapped a table in a one-minute period based on a stimuli to give me a, a, a reaction time assessment much better than a human can. And it can free that human, that PhD, that MD, that nurse, to practice at the top of their license rather than to be data entry clerks, which is what we do to so many of our uh, clinicians right now. We identify cognitive decline early. We test across the entire bell curve. Think of your SATs um, or maybe your GREs if you, if you went to graduate school. That percentile score, right? Are you at the 80th percentile, the 50th, the 40th, the 20th in attention? or memory, or thinking and planning for your age. We know where you should score based on norms. Neuropsychologists have been doing this for over 100 years. So we understand that, and we can tell if you're getting, if you're actually experiencing decline or just normal age-related changes. Our specialty is good at that. So we do this. We find MCI, we use sensitive testing. We take what was normally six hours and about $8,000 worth of testing, compress it into 20 minutes and deliver it for about $20 a patient. So we're cost effective, we're accessible, and we're scalable. Everything is done in the software. We can direct eligible patients, much like what Martin was talking about, to the right clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease. Now this is good news for that patient because there's not a lot of treatments available right now. Acubitin's getting ready to come to the market but Aricept has been a failure outside of phase three. So there's not a lot out there right now. So we can get them into the right trials to give that individual patient hope. But now that trial's enrolled and it's successful and we get data on that medication and if it's FDA approved, it gets fed back over here to close the cure gap back in the care system. So we work with both insurance companies, providers, and large pharmaceuticals across the entire spectrum of both care and cure in our space. I do want to talk a little bit about genotype versus phenotype. I think there's a lot of, of focus on genetics, and genetics are powerful. But in medicine, and I was a practitioner for years, our saying is that genetics loads the gun, environment pulls the trigger. Because it's what you do that's actually going to do the most to predict your health. Now, if I'd shown you a map of breast cancer 30 years ago, it would have said that 70% of your risk was determined by your genes. We know that's not true now. We know that's closer to 10%. And that's due to large population health studies. It's due to a better understanding that there's not one type of breast cancer, but many types of breast cancer with different pathologies. We're seeing that in Alzheimer's now. We have different paths or different pathologies that lead to the same set of symptoms that we typically think of as Alzheimer's, but the underlying physical pathology is very different and how the patient got there is very different. Early childhood education, a major social determinant. People who went to preschool have lower rates of Alzheimer's disease, much lower. Early education is a huge issue. Untreated hearing loss, if you're getting older and your hearing starts to go, get a hearing aid. It's a huge predictor through sensory deprivation of the progression of cognitive decline to Alzheimer's. You see here hypertension, obesity, smoking, depression, physical exercise, social isolation, and diabetes triples your risk for Alzheimer's disease. So there's a huge overlap of comorbidities and social determinants that are very powerful predictors of this disease. As we learn more about it, uh, my prediction for you is that this gray part, the non-modifiable, we're going to see that shrink to probably close to what it is in breast cancer, which is around 10%. The non-modifiable, we're going to see that the modifiable is actually much bigger than we think it is. Um, Jay and John know I swim laps every morning. Everybody teases me. I do it to stay skinny. I don't do it to stay skinny. I do it because both of my grandmothers had Alzheimer's disease, and I don't want that for myself. 
And I know that exercise is the most powerful thing I can do every day to lower my risk. What do we do at Savonics? This is the neuropsychology workflow. This is what I did step by step. Why am I testing this person? What do I want to know? Do I want to render a diagnosis? I'm already pretty confident they're impaired and I just need some quick objective data to verify that and render a diagnosis. What am I doing here? Am I trying to differentiate one dementia from the other? Are they appropriate for testing? We actually walk the RN or licensed practical nurse or primary care physician through this specialized thinking process to get to the right answer. Sometimes we even recommend not doing our current product. Um, and Jay and John are gonna get a shock when I tell you we're bringing out a web-based grief screen. Um, Cause actually we just really, John, yeah, see Jay's nodding. Yeah, we're gonna do it because we're, we're gonna replace what is currently done with the MMSC with something that's actually neuropsychology based. Um, we have a dashboard that is integrated, and we're integrating into EHRs this year where you can order the test much like you would order a lab, a blood test, um, and get the results back in your box. To Anil's point, that is a PDF report. And the richness of those results live in that PDF. They don't live in that portal or EHR. And that's the kind of thing we produce, right? Just what a neuropsychologist would have produced. We do a health behaviors assessment that's mapped to risk factors for dementia. We're also integrated into the Apple Health app. And with Garmin, Polar, and the Apple Watch, we are, we are able to pull data, lifestyle data from that. This is important because one of the things that we're launching next year is a single cognitive health score. This is driven by an algorithm that we've developed and are now filing a patent on that looks at your actual data coming from your wearables, your reported data, your health history, and your cognitive test results from us and formulates a cognitive health or risk score for dementia for you and then tells you what are the things that are driving your risk, right? Is it your smoking? Is it your sleep? Is it your diet? Is it your, you know, look at your pulse ox, if we're getting that, say, from, from a wearable, we're able to then tell you what's driving that risk. And this is really powerful because it's actionable data. And I, I think going back to um, what Anil and Martin said, you can't just dump data on people. You actually have to give them um, context around that data and things that they can take away, things that they can do and understand what are, what, what's within my power to change my health. Um, we produce a re report. We have a diagnostic support tool for our Medicare Advantage uh, folks and providers that meets CMS requirements. Our digital therapeutics, um, I brought IP with me out of Stanford that had over 20 years of research, uh, about $30 million into it. We are going to be bringing those to the market in June under the relaxed FDA guidance for COVID. So we've got enough data that we meet the requirements uh, to bring our digitudics for free to consumers during the shelter in place period for the elderly. They address depression, um, anxiety, and um, domains in cognition like executive function, attention, focus, and memory. We deliver an insights platform, not quite as fancy as Anil's, but ours is really focused on cognitive health and dementia risk. And so we also have um, a data dashboard where a large plan or a, a pharmaceutical looking at multiple clinical trials can map the statistics across their population. We just, we simply solve the scalability problem. Neuropsychology has existed for a long time, but it's expensive and slow, and it's a Luddite profession. We, you know, I've already talked about a lot of this. It's prohibitively expensive. Um, I, could be wake, I could be making way more in private practice than I'm making running a startup right now. It is insanely expensive. It requires an office visit. We're able to be done at home. And I think that's really powerful. We have a virtual neuropsychologist. Right now, it's spoken word. Um, next year, because we're built in the you know, Unity 3D gaming engine, you're gonna get to pick your neuropsychologist, pick your doctor, it'll be an avatar. You'll, you know, where they went to school, all this cool stuff, and they'll guide you through your tests. So we're even updating um, our capabilities around there. It's a busy space. There's a lot of people that are in this space. The majority of them come out of research, not clinical practice. And that's fine. There's a lot of great people in research, but they're missing a lot, like workflows. And the fact that nobody bothered to map the tests they do to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Standards for Diagnosing Dementia, which if you're going to get reimbursed, which it's all about payment, which John mentioned earlier, matters because CMS wants gold standard assessments. They don't want the, ne the next new gimmicky thing. What I think is so magical about Savonics is we marry you know, absolute um, state-of-the-art technology with enough medical orthodoxy to be reimbursed and acceptable. 
our business model is pretty straightforward. Software as a service. And we have great traction. We just um, signed a deal uh, today with Fujitsu, uh, finalized that to do population health screening in the elderly in Japan on a new phone that they're launching that, that's specifically for the elderly. Um, and we are in late stage negotiations um, over here with Humana. This proposal went in ahead of COVID, got a little slowed down, but now they're more excited than ever to go as they're looking at how to do big pieces of the annual health risk assessment to capture their capitation uh, risk adjusted factor. Somebody asked about capitation earlier. Capitation is I'm Medicare Advantage, I'm gonna pay you $1,000 a month to manage this patient. Savonics, our, our risk adjusted factor if we detect impairment is 0.45 or an additional $450 per month per patient when impairment is detected on a risk adjusted factor. This is value-based care, right? Adjusting to that capitation rate for the health problem that this patient has with their, with their um, cognition. And I'm trying to get it to advance, it doesn't want to. Our team are amazing. Um, I'm the least impressive person on this slide. Um, I really surrounded myself with an incredible group of people. Uh, Penn, our chief business officer, actually um, knew Savonics and worked with us um, on the customer side for a few years before joining. And Simon Collinson, I really wanna call out our chief science officer, um, founder and chair of the Department of Neuropsychology at National University of Singapore, uh, widely regarded as one of the top three to five neuropsychologists in the entire world, um, was hired by a customer to evaluate our technology against several competitors, and ultimately uh, decided to come on board as our CSO. So I was really um, honored to have him. He knows way more than I do about neuropsych. He actually went to Oxford with my mentor from Stanford. So small world. And Rajesh, our head of product, and Dan, our CTO, who's been a CEO twice, uh, co-founded two digital health companies, sold one to HealthGrade, sold one to IBM. Um, never wants my job again, because um, he hates this stuff, loves running the tech. So a little highlight from the team, a very impressive group of people. And um, we're very lucky also to have John Knackle um, as, our, as our board chair. So we feel really, uh, really blessed to have John as a, as a major contributing member of the team. And I'm happy to take questions. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you very much, Mylea. And uh, you know, we do we do have way more questions than we probably have time. But um, and it's a good reminder to our audience that uh, you know we we've just heard some really in depth, maybe in the uh, close to TMI <laughs> category, too much information for some people. But we've heard some in depth discussion. This may be the future, it may be just a little bit of a top of the iceberg of the entire future. So uh, I, I remember back to the early days, 1990s, and I was moderating a panel of biotech companies down in Southern California, and there were a couple of early stage companies on that uh, panel, and uh, we basically said the same thing. You know, this all sounds really interesting, but it's all really out there and really speculative. And one of those companies on the panel happened to be Amgen. Uh, <laughs> so uh, what we wish uh, you and uh, Neil is uh, that you become Amgen or that you, maybe more than that, fulfill your why. So let's get to a couple of the questions. One of them, remembering that we're talking writ large of, uh, future of healthcare, uh, kind of a general question is, I used to hear that family history was really important, like the number one thing about how, what I would get sick with. Do you think that's still true? How, mu how much evidence is there that that's not true, or do you think will be coming in the future? It's true, but it's complicated, because family history isn't just genes. So families pass on way more than their genes. They pass on ways of thinking about the world. They pass on political views. They pass on nutrition habits. I grew up on a 10,000 acre ranch. I didn't eat anything from a supermarket until I was in college. Not kidding. Except maybe at other people's houses. So I grew up being really, really healthy. So, you know, how much of, that's part of my family history, but that's my phenotype. It's not my genotype, right? So my attitudes about food, and how to eat, um, my attitudes about exercise, seeing my parents being physically active, 
you know, all shaped me. So it's very difficult unless you do a twin study, identical twins and they're separated at birth. It is impossible to separate genes from environment when we look at families. And we also now know that environment can change your genes, epigenetics, telomere length. There are, these are, it's not like, and the environment acts on them. Genes exist, the environment acts on them, the genes act on the environment. This is a, this is a back and forth relationship. Well, and so at some point, maybe we need to have a, a, a whole future of CRISPR and how all that connects together. We will be sending out some uh, links to different TED Talks and things on, on that piece. So, um, but that relates to another kind of series of questions we have around who gets um, this care. And so you talked about the, uh, you know, the internet of things and wearable devices. And I mean, that, uh, I guess, uh, Neil, uh, Tim Cook, who you used to work with, that, that's his old mantra, right? Is the future of Apple is, uh, is healthcare, not, not, you know, the iPhone. <laughs> and, and so um, there's a lot of folks in the world, though, that can't afford all that stuff. And you said that one of the uh, diagnosis pieces was low income. So how does that all mesh up in, in the near future of the next five to 10 years? It's really good question. So a big piece of why we did the wearable integration was actually to build the algorithm around lifestyle and verify self-report and its accuracy. So you tell me that you exercise every day, but your polar tells me that you're full of it. <laughs> Right. Um, and that's actually good to know um, the reliability of self report. And so one of the things is, you know, data in context. When we think about accessibility, this is actually why we're doing a web based version. Um, we have the Unity app. Um, one of the reasons we're, we're completely on uh, touch screen devices, phones and tablets, not desktop. Desktop computers are expensive. Um, we're built in Unity because it allows us to be device agnostic and work with as much precision to do cognitive testing in a cheap knockoff phone in China as it does on the latest iPhone 10 in Silicon Valley. This was important to me. Um, I grew up in a small town. I grew up in a farming family. Uh, again, the aha moment of like my grandmother not being able to afford me if she was still alive. That is vital to us. I think, you know, for me, Savonics is a double bottom line company. You know, we can create this accessibility and we can create parity while at the same time we build a, a very valuable business. Um, and we work really hard every day to, to balance those things. Eventually, um, maybe we'll go directly to consumers. Right now we go through um, payers and programs. We're already in China, doing work in China. We've already uh, done several contracts in Japan. China's really interesting to me because it lacks EHR, it lacks, lacks, it lacks an infrastructure that will push back against a new way of doing what we do. Um, and I know there's a lot of people who say, why would you go to China? Well, you know, that's a big story. It's a big conversation that happened at JP Morgan a few years ago when uh, somebody who knew my personal history set me down and told me about a woman my age in Shanghai with a grandmother in rural China. So, you know, I think for us, we're very focused on, um, on keeping this affordable um, and, and, keeping, and keeping it highly accessible. Let me add to Malia's comments there as well. This is where it all ties back to value-based care, value-based payment. So you've got now where your Medicare Advantage, where you are uh, serving a population that populate whoever's taking on that risk for that care now has every incentive to keep that patient out of the hospital, keep that patient out of the emergency room, uh, ambulances, et cetera. So all of that relies on whatever technology it takes. And in fact, the technologies you're talking about, Dennis, are actually very small in comparison to one emergency room visit. So now it makes sense for that value-based payer, whoever is taking on that risk, to provide the, the mobility, the wearables, the technology that it takes to serve that patient. So I actually think this will provide more technology 
to underserved populations, not less. Yeah, that that's a that's a great thing, a great add-on, and a beautiful future if we can pull it off. So the last question really is, if we can pull it off, related to the fact that so many patients, much less just people in general, don't follow prescriptions or don't even file their prescriptions. So I know, Mylea, you're 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 big into the behavioral side. How do you how do you fix that? That is the holy grail. So I'm, I'm going to tell you some really interesting stories though from my own years in clinical practice. So I was a little bit of an avant-garde psychologist. When people had depression, I didn't sit in a room and talk with them about their depression. I made them go for a walk with me during their 50-minute hour because I knew that walk would do. I see a Neil laughing, right? Because it does more than sitting in a room and talking to me. So how do we think about and, and it helped reinforce the behavior change because at the end, I'm like, do you feel better? Yeah, it's because I'm talking to you. No, it's not me. It was the walk. Go for a walk by yourself. You're going to feel just as good. You don't need me. I'm superfluous, right? I'm just the catalyst that got you to walk. And this was how I would talk to my patients. So one of the things I, I had a lot of my folks do because I'm dual eligible for boards in health and neuropsychology. And the health piece is all about nutrition and exercise and how physical and mental health interplay is I had my patients keep food journals. And I'm gonna tell you something that I noticed, and I actually did a little analysis on this and presented it at Grand Rounds, which was that when a patient saw me, in the next like five days, their food journal was really, really good. Because for about five days, they would do what I told them to do. Fruits and vegetables went up, you know, exercise went up, they were keeping, and, and I could see behavior change. And then, you know, and I was treating patients where sometimes I didn't see them, I only saw them once a month, because I also saw folks at the VA two days a week. And I would see the behavior start to do this, right? And then they'd see me and it would get better again. And then it was like this roller, roller coaster. So, you know, what I think technology can do to solve that piece of the puzzle is be that reminder, be that dock in your pocket that is a good reminder of what to do. One of the best apps that I love is called Shopwell. And it's because when I had patients with diabetes, I would give them this piece of paper and everything on it was sugar, malodextrin, polypropylene glycol, fructose, glucose. They would identify three or four things as sugar. Everything on the page was sugar. They didn't even know how to read food, food labels. Shopwell is a great app. It's developed at Stanford. I put in my diagnosis, whether it's celiac disease or diabetes or whatever, and I can scan and take photos of food when I'm in the store, and it'll tell me, should I buy it or not? And it's pretty aggressive about the no. It's basically like a big red thing through. So, you know, I think one of the ways for me that technology can be transformative to behavior is to stick with a person in a way that their doctor can't on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, just like I got my, my patient would go for a walk when I was there, right? How can we use technology to reinforce messages to be that kind of constant companion um, that helps us remember what we need to do and, and, and helps motivate. There are always going to be people that don't do the thing. So the best way to prevent Alzheimer's is not to smoke, moderate alcohol, exercise every day and get enough sleep, all these things. I'm doing some of it, the sleep part. Mm. But the, the fact is a certain percent of patients are never going to do those things and we do need to develop pharmacotherapy for them. We shouldn't just leave people behind because they, they don't make these changes and, and allow them to get sick. You know, this is a complex question. I mean, it's the holy grail. But I, I do think technology, based on what I saw in my own patients, can solve a piece of it, not all of it. When it comes to health, there's no silver bullet. We need a lot of lead bullets. All right. Well, that's, that's a great quote to end on. And, and uh, Horowitz, I can't take credit for it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very good. So uh, we, we have run over our time, but great material, great information. Thank you to everyone. John, Jay, Eric, Anil, Mylea. Uh, fantastic information. And I will say the same thing that I said on that panel in the early 90s uh, with the biotechnology. I hope that all of you accomplish your future dreams because that means the world will be a much better place. So. <laughs> <laughs> the same wish for you. And, and thank you to all of our audience uh, in the United States and around the world. 
And just a reminder, this is only stage one of Healthcare Week. We have two more stages on Friday. Friday morning, we have Is Healthcare Investing in the Public Markets a Fat Pitch, a Warren Buffett term for a good pitch over the plate. And then Friday afternoon, uh, as John mentioned, we are back with some of the Wavemaker folks and another series of guests around COVID-19 and specific issues related to it. So more to come. Thank you all.